I'm happy to introduce uh, Tiziana Terranova now, and I think it's a really interesting development, actually, now we're really looking into the digital sphere in relationship to many of the questions. Tiziana Terranova teaches, researches, lectures, and writes about the culture and political economy of digital media and what network cultures. Um, what I find particularly interesting now in actually looking also maybe even more technically what that type of distribution and how those speech acts, let's say, are distributed in the, in the digital sphere. She's currently Associate Professor in Cultural Studies and Digital Media at the Università degli Studi di Napoli L'Orientale, um, where she co-founded the Technoculture Research Unit. Um, and there's actually a website for it, which is technoculture.it. She is often engaged in public speaking, including her participation to the Nobel Prize Foundation Dialogue in Santiago uh, in Chile in 2019, where she discussed the relation between neuroscience and the notion of the attention economy. She is the author of Network Culture Politics for the Information Age, uh, published by Pluto Press in 2004, and numerous other essays and reviews published in newspapers, magazines, websites, and journals. Um, she's a member of the editorial board of the journal Theory, Culture and Society, New Formation, Subjectivity and Studi Culturali. She's currently working on a new book on the genealogy of digital social networks. There you go. Uh, um, which will be titled Hypersocial um, with uh, Minnesota University Press. And actually a collection of her essays on automation, neurocapitalism, social cooperation and the common is also to be published soon by Semiotexte. Tiziana, thank you so much for being with us. Thank it's you, uh, yeah. Yeah, really thank a pleasure, you. and I'll leave the floor to you. Thank you, and thank you, Warren, for inviting me again. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to come to Warren's uh, events uh, and also to see how you, know, you kind of uh, saw into the future. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the things that we were discussing in LA in 2012 uh, become uh, ever more relevant. Uh, so this question of, of, of the brain and the neuroplasticity that you, you know, early engage in early on has proven uh, to be kind of, uh, uh, you know, to, to be a good uh, grasp of the future and w which is the present now, the, the way in which neurotechnologies, uh, priming, uh, nudge economics, and all of that is coming into being, uh, show that you were on the good track. So again, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's nice to be at the Cafoscari coming from L'Orientale, which is uh, the, counterpart, the Italian counterpart of uh, the Ca Foscari because we both have this kind of uh, tradition of teaching uh, oriental uh, uh, languages. Uh, uh, I, got, I got involved with this project uh, five years ago, now six years, seven, six, nine, seven years ago, 2012, when Warren invited me to talk uh, in LA uh, about the psychopathologies of cognitive capitalism uh, it's interesting that uh, he chose the term cognitive capitalism, which he has been working on uh, ever since. Uh, um, this term was originally formulated, uh, as he explains, also in one of the uh, books uh, edited, uh, published with archive books. It was a term that came from the French-Italian uh, school of autonomist or post-workerist uh, Marxism. Uh, he had been coined, coined uh, uh, by um, political economist, uh, such as Carlo Vercellone, Andrea Fumagalli, and Stefano Lucarelli. Uh, and he reread the, the interesting operation that uh, was accomplished in this series of uh, conferences was to see this question of cognitive capitalism through the lenses of a uh, um, Guattarian schizo analysis, uh, rethought through the lenses of contemporary neuroscience and digital technologies. And this is uh, uh, something that, of course, in Italy, Franco Berardi before has been uh, 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 fundamental in articulating uh, this, point, this point of view, both bridging the political, political economy of cognitive capitalism uh, with Guattari's, but then moving into the kind of neurosciences uh, and also into digital technologies. I think that it was in the first um, essay that he uh, published for uh, archive books where he said explicitly that this coming together of the European tradition, which uh, uh, she represented, Kira represented before, uh, which is about history and philosophy and the uh, Northern American tradition, which is more about the sciences and technology and, and, and also a kind of a, uh, kind of history of uh, work on uh, consciousness, psychedelic con forms of consciousness should come together uh, in that way in, in LA. 
So uh, Berard has been a constant inspiration, I think, for this, uh, for this kind of work, and it's very, uh, um, very much acknowledged uh, in, in the books by his presence and references to his work. So the term cognitive capitalism uh, was introduced by saying that unlike the notion of the knowledge economy, it was meant to keep an emphasis uh, on, the, on labor. So cognitive uh, for Carlo Vercellone, when he introduced the term in the late 2000s, uh, referred not to capitalism as such, but the, the mutated composition of labor. So the cognitive in capitalism uh, uh, represented cognitive labor as the new kind of uh, central form of labor mobilized by contemporary uh, capitalism. So what the theory of cognitive capitalism asked us was to rethink what labor meant today after the industrial uh, factory had been subsumed within informational networks and now systems such as platforms. So it's not that industrial labor is not there, there has been an intensification of industrial labor, but it's organized uh, uh, by means of informational networks uh, and now platforms. So the thesis was that this change, this economic and political change, had not only mobilized uh, uh, the muscular capacity uh, of the human body, but the cognitive uh, potential, implying also that capitalism uh, reach extended uh, outside the space of, uh, and times of work into society at large, so bringing to an end uh, the separation between production and consumption and work and leisure. So all activities uh, uh, in, in ways that were uh, different than uh, the kind of model uh, uh, for, um, explored by the Frankfurt School had been subsumed within this kind of the, this economic uh, activity. Uh, this is, uh, I think it's interesting, the way in which uh, uh, the term cognitive capitalism by insisting the cognitive represented a kind of labor power, or living labor, mobilized by capitalism, differ by other terms uh, such as surveillance capitalism. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Shoshana Zuboff's uh, book, which has uh, been um, a kind of a bestseller already, blockbuster of a book, you know, featured in the press, uh, uh, Observer, Guardian, uh, very much uh, read. It's a 600 pages uh, tome, volume. Uh, uh, dedicated to the exploration uh, of the techniques uh, employed by tech giants uh, such as Facebook and Google to harvest uh, uh, behavioral data, what she calls behavioral surplus, which are then uh, um, become uh, this kind of part of this kind of uh, info flow, semiotic flow of data on um, semiosis involving machines uh, as well. And it's interesting because in surveillance capitalism, uh, there is no mention, it's only capital that is the actor. It's capital is the actor of surveillance. While cognitive capitalism maintained uh, this kind of Marxist notion that capitalism is a, is a relationship and what it relates to is this kind of living labor power uh, that somehow needs to control and that somehow by its nature tends to try to escape as if animated by an original drive towards uh, freedom, which can be contested, but it's again, it's kind of one of the staples of these uh, points of view. So when um, uh, looking at this issue, I was also inspired uh, by Jonathan Crady's work on, uh, on the history of the relationship between uh, capitalism and technology from the point of view of how, of the question of how capitalism can be seen as having constantly been in, in, in engaged in revolutionizing the means of perception. So Crady, Crady talks about the 19th century uh, as a time when um, all the perceptual habits uh, what uh, uh, Warren Neidich uh, referencing contemporary uh, different trends in neurosciences uh, uh, calls uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, Warren right now that the term used must be the heat escapes me, but the, the kind of repertoire Right, the repertoire, primary and secondary repertoire, start being upset by these machines that ask workers to pay very close attention to something in a repetitive way. So it's a very different modality of uh, paying attention than the one that the farmer or a peasant could have been in an industrial factory. So he talks about the history of capitalism as a constant uh, refiguration of uh, techniques uh, that are used to discipline the brain's attentive capacities. Uh, 
calling this a continuation of the modern theme of the crisis of attentiveness. So we're talking about it with a um, sociologist of education just last week, uh, Ben Williamson, who used all these terms such as neuroliberalism <laughs> or neurotechnologies, uh, uh, saying how first, uh, you know, the kind of uh, students' perceptual patterns are disrupted by technologies such as uh, mobile phones, smartphones brought into the classroom, and then you have kind of uh, the development of neurotechnologies meant to assess uh, or to measure the level of attention the pupils pay in the classroom. So this constant play between kind of uh, upsetting uh, established modes of perception and then trying to kind of discipline them again or to bring them under some kind of control again, uh, it's a long trend uh, that we're seeing even today. So my contribution <laughs> to the original uh, Psychopathologies of Cognitive Capitalism, part one, uh, was very much fun. For me, it was very playful. I got to enjoy myself for a, for a, for a change, um, um, writing, writing something without being you know, under the control of the peer review journals and all, all that we have that kind of keeps us in place. Uh, it followed on a previous uh, essay I'd written uh, on the attention economy, uh, which had been published for the online journal Culture Machine and they was very seriously picked up by a Bank of England blogger <laughs> quite recently, which thought it was a really good idea to you know, turn attention into an economy. And so I read the article ag against it. And so it was you know, something that I worked on for like, uh, a few years, uh, again, around the mid 2010s. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that Warren is giving me this opportunity to go back uh, to that and rethink about it uh, a, a little bit. So my idea, and it was based on actual uh, studying documents uh, and statements and discourses that were coming out of uh, kind of fringe economic discourse. They were like popular, it was not quite business schools, uh, uh, but it was the kind of text uh, that businessmen buy in airports uh, and tell them what to do. Uh, so yeah, it was kind of serious and not serious, but yeah, definitely an appeal to uh, entrepreneur working in this field. Uh, was that uh, you could reestablish uh, a, a kind of um, mainstream economic tenets in the new economy, the digital economy, uh, as it was called, uh, because before it was always in a crisis, there was too much information. What do you do with information? Information needs to be free. Uh, you cannot charge people for information. So what kind of economy can you have? So the idea that these uh, writers uh, were putting up uh, based on um, um, economic thinking from the 1970s was that uh, the new um, uh, economy, uh, the information destroyed attention because the more information you had, the least uh, attention you had available uh, uh, to read and understand what you were uh, paying attention to. So the new scarce uh, commodity was attention because uh, the, the brain was limited in its capacity to pay attention. It couldn't pay attention all the time or remember all the time. So uh, the new economy was based on economizing attention, uh, trying to compete for the attention of audiences. Uh, uh, then there were all these writings about the economization, um, uh, how to turn attention into a financial product. Uh, uh, you could write futures uh, uh, about attention. So it was interesting because I got the chance of looking at all this uh, e literature about the turning of attention or the, uh, this brain capacity, the kind of conatus of the brain, uh, Tart called it, into some kind of uh, economic entity. But what uh, um, Warren's uh, uh, symposium uh, gave me the chance to do was uh, not looking not just uh, at economic discourse uh, in terms of something that was trying to make the brain um, attention in economic quantity, but to look at the relationship with the brain that was being established in neuroeconomics. I'm not surprised at all that there is this convergence between uh, uh, Department of Economics and Neuroscience. Uh, in fact, most of the article I wrote for this was all about neuroeconomics, uh, because uh, reading about the uh, neuroeconomic um, experiment, uh, it was quite clear uh, that there was an, uh, an attempt uh, to describe uh, the economic subject uh, into some kind of brain mechanisms, and this brain mechanism was pleasure at the time. And this is where I think now we're in a different space because it's not so much about pleasure anymore, but it's about cognition. So the, uh, the, the, the emphasis uh, has shifted, it's moved. So um, 
see seven years ago, you know, when we started talking about it, uh, there was a lot of uh, moral panic uh, about the fact that what Google was doing to our brain. Like what all this internet, uh, you know, being on the phone all the time, on, on being on, on the internet, going from web page to web page, social media, what they were doing to our brain. And the idea was that they were degrading uh, the, our capacity to pay attention. So we, you know, people were not paying, even remembering uh, the, the, uh, the ads that Google was putting in their feet. You know, the advertisers complained that, that uh, there was a degradation of attention compared with television or even with other forms. Uh, um, and also there were all this um, research. I remember that I used uh, an experiment by a neuroscientist on uh, anodynia. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, subjects who could not experience pleasure because of something was wrong with their brain failed to make proper economic decisions. So they were failed economic subjects. So on the one hand, uh, you kind of uh, uh, turned the uh, excess of pleasure that people had in uh, spending time with their devices into a pathology. On the other side, hand, you said that without pleasure, you couldn't have an economy. So you couldn't have an economic subject. So that was interesting uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, it was fun to kind of also look at the ways in which this team had been taken up in popular culture, was losing in popular and militant culture. I kind of used, um, uh, in the article, I used uh, Zero Calcare, who was a cult Italian uh, comedian, and he who did this strip about the kind of, uh, he, had to finish this, uh, he had to finish this article, or they had to finish something uh, for somebody, and then he decided to just, uh, uh, open uh, his email to check before starting going to work, and then he finds himself four hours later. He doesn't know what happened. <laughs> he, you know, his deadline, is, he missed his deadline, and also he has all these animal spirits which represent different parts of himself, and the part of him that represents his work ethic is Margaret Thatcher. So, and he's got this Margaret Thatcher character kind of beating him up about the fact that he couldn't, he didn't finish his work. So he kind of blames uh, this hypnotic chat that would be inbuilt into Facebook, so that when you kind of start, you kind of lose track of time. So I was playing with the, in the article with this idea that, again, uh, you know, digital technologies, in a sense, uh, both uh, uh, construct a, a new kind of economic subject, uh, which is supposed to enjoy or to kind of work through a reward punishment mechanism, and on the other hand, it's a subject that kind of keeps slipping away. So another example was the, the, the kind of this provocative campaign that uh, the Italian the, the, uh, social centers in Rome did uh, uh, at the time. They had all these posters complaining about uh, the, the races in the price of drugs. So like cocaine has been up 12% and how there was uh, a threat to the bare life of the cognitariat that you needed drugs to perform in this kind of economy. So it was this economization of, uh, of the brain and the cognitive capacities that was interesting uh, for me at the time and the question of degradation of attention. I think today we're in a different space and I think this is reflected in the way Warren has kind of moved on. So what is happening lately, uh, there's been several things. Uh, one has been the exposition of the, the behaviorist techniques that have been used uh, in designing users interfaces. So what we, kind of, we were discussing uh, in terms of this, uh, uh, the way in which these technologies were mobilizing the pleasure centers of the brain has been confirmed uh, by insiders uh, who, who kind of come out and say they, they really regret how they were involved uh, in studying all this behavioral psychology in order to uh, build uh, technologies that would maximize engagement by keeping people going back and back and back and back for this uh, dopamine uh, rush, if it's dopamine. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know, it became a kind of public scandal, uh, this question of uh, the addiction by design, to cite a very good book about Las Vegas, uh, which explores these issues. And uh, this has been, uh, you know, uh, Zuboff's book uh, has a lot of this, apparently. She uh, looks at how data extraction is based in this kind of uh, uh, behavioral design, and this is uh, uh, causing uh, people to call them neurotechnologies uh, in, in a strict sense. Uh, the other element that is also new is the renaissance of artificial intelligence, which I think is a recent uh, thing compared to seven years ago and the way in which uh, uh, this renaissance uh, in artificial intelligence is based in machine learning 
and machine learning uh, uh, is gone from the kind of uh, symbolic, deductive uh, AI structure to uh, kind of deep learning, uh, uh, so the return to the brain, to neural networks, although not the same thing as the brain, of course, as a model for machines uh, uh, to learn. So this is another new element. And uh, uh, the question of uh, the openness, the suggestion, the, 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 the post-truth the post debate has been about the social brain as something that is open to suggestion and manipulation and something that can undermine the whole concept of truth uh, altogether. So it's also uh, kind of interest. Uh, I have learned from uh, media studies and software studies scholars also a few interesting uh, uh, um, moment in these passages. Uh, I appreciated, for example, the way in which Yuk Yui uh, uh, has, uh, has worked, has shown how uh, through the technology of the semantic web, uh, which is uh, uh, starting with HTML language, and then through the, all the different evolution, XML, uh, and then Open Graph, uh, which is Facebook protocols, uh, the, the web has become uh, readable both to machines and to humans. So he said before, uh, you know, the, the kind of machine and human levels were separated. The content of messages was not accessible to machines. It was not coded to be understood by machines. With HTML, you, you start getting a machine language, uh, uh, a language encoded in web pages that machines can read. And this has progressed, and this is the kind of the source of the big data revolution, is that all communication has become semantically understandable uh, by by machines, so this is a big, uh, interesting uh, moment. He calls it the kind of uh, meta-digital uh, uh, moment. And also from Luciana Parisi, uh, a good friend of mine, I've learned, she's worked on artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, in an article on EFLUX, which is about post-truth, uh, I think she has convincingly argued about the relationship between the whole fake news post-truth phenomenon and these new forms of art, uh, algorithmic intelligence. So she, uh, uh, she argues that uh, these um, new forms are no longer looking, so it's not just humans who are not preoccupied with truth anymore, but it's machines in the first place. So these new forms of machinic intelligence are not concerned uh, with the relationship between truth and fact, which was still a feature of original cybernetic machines. Uh, they're not concerned with verifying and explaining uh, uh, problem, but she say uh, they have become, um, they've gone meta-digital. Uh, they, uh, what they try to do is, uh, um, they try to make deci decisions. So they, they work constantly against this background of data, trying to make the correct decisions to induce the kind, uh, the right kind of action. So they are about the modulation of conduct and no longer uh, uh, about the truth or the correspondence between truth and fact. And I think that's an important element that paradoxically, the deployment of deep learning neural network structures in machine has caused uh, the, 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 the new forms of uh, machining intelligence to go beyond truth mm. uh, and towards what she calls a kind of new forms of decisionism. So it's more important to make the, the fast decision rather than make a, a correct decision for this, uh, for this machine. I think that, uh, um, and she's got an interesting uh, definition of post-truth, uh, she said a uh, post-truth political machinery, which is an assemblage, employs a heuristic testing of responses uh, that record our conducts, evolve, change, adapt, uh, and revolt uh, in order to maximize attentive capacity across populations of billions. I think this lack of correspondence between truth and fact on the side of the machine, but also on the side of the, the brain, which is looking for com confirmation, is uh, uh, both at work in the kind of current post-truth environment. And, um, oh yeah, the definition of post-truth is the art of relying on affective predispositions or reactions already known or expressed to stage old beliefs as though they were new. So there is a work so for Luciana, post-truth politics is the art of relying on affective predispositions or reactions already known, or in any way expressed <laughs> somewhere, to stage old beliefs as though they were new. It's an interesting definition combining both the affective, the cognitive, and the, and the machine. 
So I'd like to finish uh, by, uh, again, thanking Warren for getting me to look at the Pizzagate thing, which, of course, being in Italy, I had kind of missed <laughs> in its complexity. So I read with great interest uh, the Rolling Stones article as well. The, there was one of the ones that reconstructed the whole thing. And um, the whole chain, which I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the, in the exhibition. So the way I reconstructed it, you know, they reconstructed it, and it took me, I think, one year to figure out how it all started, to just go through all the layers and all the passages and understand how this thing came to bring somebody physically with a gun inside a, a pizza shop for looking for a pedophile ring. So they, they reconstructed the, mm, in this way. It was an anonymous planting of various seeds of various kind of uh, unlike, more or less likely news by boats or agents in the hope that somebody would be, something would be picked up by a human user, and it was picked up by this uh, middle-aged uh, woman from the Midwest, mid mid who forwarded it to uh, uh, Twitter sphere by means of Shef Shepherd's account, uh, which were then retweeted and picked up by the trap entourage, and then made to pass through clusters such as Infowars and Breitbart, then uh, going in onto YouTube. Then, you know, there was the episode of the attempted shooting, which should have brought an end to this. And then there is the afterlives uh, through the Pizzagate Israel hashtag on Twitter, which still uh, exists. That was really interesting, because uh, I picked up on uh, something that the author of the article said, which says that it was a case of unwitting cooperation. They unwittingly cooperated. So the people who were involved in spreading the Pizzagate uh, um, story, which was, uh, to me, the, uh, I, I'm a kind of an old James E. Roy fan, and it was pure language from like uh, the James E. Roy tabloid from the 1950s, 1940s. It was exactly the same language. It's quite amazing. So um, the, it was a, you know, a case of unwitting cooperation. It was a kind of machinic assemblage uh, you had where these bad actors plant a variety of seeds looking for a host to humanize the information and then relying on this interaction between strategic players uh, with uh, their own account and networks uh, and counting on something which uh, you know, we might call a social brain milieu where beliefs exist as tendencies that can activate conducts. So uh, it was interesting to me that they would use this term unwitting cooperation because it was one of the terms deployed by Yokai Benkler, uh, who then analyzed network propaganda himself in the uh, 2000 to talk about the new forms of social production. Uh, the, according to him, the internet was going to be something that was going to bring about new forms of uh, social cooperation and said this social cooperation could be conscious or unconscious. It could be something that people didn't know. So uh, it's interesting to me, what, uh, again, what Warren said about uh, uh, how it's extracranial, neuroesthetics is extracranial and not just intracranial, because it's this machinic assemblages where you have uh, uh, this really, you know, it's about setting something into motion and the kind of, kind of steering. Uh, seems to me that there is already a neuroesthetic of the right at work, of the right wing, and uh, it's quite obvious that, that there's no, there's nothing like that which can act as a counterpart at the moment to this kind of movement. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to go back to some really fun, <laughs> interesting uh, material uh, and, and see you know, what, what happened in the span of time between 2012 and now uh, in, the, in the light of all that, that happened.